Thanks a lot. So yeah, um, this is kind of a joint project with uh, colleagues from Torun, uh, Swabek and Przemyslwak. And um, yeah, I'm right now positioned at the Leibniz Centrum Allgemeine Sprachwissenschaften in Berlin, but I was also working for a while in Torun and this is one of the results of our joint project. Um, so where I basically come from, let me just see if I can discuss, yeah, is um, I was working a lot with evolutionary game theory, studying communication systems there. So this is a very, I would say, evolutionary approach. And the idea is then to transfer the ideas from there to the lab and see if it's possible to reproduce similar results. Let me be a little bit more detailed. Um, what I was looking at in the past is um, like you can have game theory descriptions of, of communication games or sig the most popular one is the signaling game, for example, um, it's similar to the naming game in some aspects. This is a game theory description and uh, you have specific strategies how you to communicate information and you have different strategies or population of different strategies. And then you have mathematical formulation for um, evolutionary, or you can call it adaptive dynamics uh, that uh, um, replicate selection, replication, and mutation. And you have a very rich mathematical framework for this and very good, well-established formal tools. Um, for example, do to detect evolutionary stability. So there's really mathematical definitions for this. this is quite nice. So you can really say, okay, this kind of strategy is evolutionary stable according to the mathematical de definition under specific adaptive dynamics. You can calculate something like Bayesian of attraction, what means uh, the amount of different population, mixed population stage from where um, the adaptive dynamics drives the system to a specific strategy. Um, or you can uh, calculate so-called emergence frequencies that gives you kind of an impression what kind of communication strategies are more successful than others starting with a or more probable uh, emerge starting from a random random um, population state. Um, and this was a lot uh, applied in, uh, for example, an animal communication in uh, bio uh, theoretical biology. Uh, also a lot in philosophy, you saw the plenary yesterday by Kaylin O'Connor, who she's also working um, yeah, with this kind of models, so the signaling games. Now, and the, the idea here is that um, we try to replicate a similar setting in the lab. So instead of a popula population, we have participants. Um, the strategies are kind of um, uh, entailed by the game rules that are um, explained the participants. And we have similar um, mechanisms, of course. We have selections in form of that participants have to make a choice what they do in each round. And since we have repeated interaction, we have replication. And not only this, in this kind of experiments, we have fitness-based replication in the sense that um, you can you get you know, points for successful communication in these games. And they get uh, they get later um, yeah uh, paid out in, in in real money. So these are basic components here. Um, we have the game rules. We have real payoff, and a similarity um, or something uh, at least one thing that helps you to compare the results with um, uh, formal and computational studies is you can also detect emergent frequencies. You make a number of different experiments, and, and then you can measure how often a specific communication system emerges. Um, it's, when I use the term communication system, this, is, this should be a very general term that could mean um, you know, just simple alarm calls, or it could also mean um, a more complex grammar humans use. So I abstract from this in this point. But the, the most basic aspect that I'm interested in uh, is, is for meaning mappings. So uh, very basic. Um, uh, yeah, part of, of, of language or uh, uh, of communication in general, if you want. Now, let me very shortly introduce, um, this is a standard Lewis signaling game where you have information states, which are private information to the sender. For example, here you would have three different information states. Uh, in, in, this, in this case, they are distinct entities. Of course, you can also have 
um, you, uh, um, like like a dimension of of a specific um, a spectrum of a specific entity, but we have different kind of entities, like a set, and the, we have here three items, so to speak, um, which are an eagle, a lion, and a scorpion, for example. And then we have different signals um, that the sender can send to a receiver, and then the receiver can choose response actions or that 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 in this very simple model we have response actions are perfectly fit to information states you can have alter alternations to this but um, this is really the most basic setup here that i plan to use or i use and now how do strategies look like these are just simple for mini mappings and you can have all different kind of mappings here and this would be a combination of mappings that Louis called a perfect signaling system. So these are one-to-one -one mappings between information states, signals, and response actions, and they lead to perfect communicative success. I don't have any mathematical mathematical formulas here, but in this game, uh, in this simple game, it's just uh, so the utility is just defined um, as when the information state makes the response action for a specific, you know. Um, sender strategy and receiver strategy pair, then you score one point. So in other, other, other words, when communication is successful, you get one point, otherwise zero. And you can also alter this, of course. Um, this, is, this is a game that is studied a lot in also economics, uh, also ex experimentally um, in economics and uh, also philosophy. Um, what is something that is not studied uh, a lot is a uh, little alternation of the game. And this allows for what I call contextual cues. Here's a simple example. Let's say the information state um, correlate with specific um, cues. Here, for example, um, the eagle only appears at night and the scorpion only appears at, at day. Um, and this is also very, um, you know, optimized assumption that there, there's, this is perfect reliable. Then you can, and you have, uh, otherwise you have the same game. Uh, important info, uh, thing is that speaker and receiver uh, or sender and receiver have access to this kind of contextual cues. Then you can, of course, establish a perfect signaling system again, but you can also establish something what I call a perfect um, ambiguous system because here's a signal A is, is, is used uh, ambiguously for eagle and scorpion, but the receiver has now here the option to disambiguate uh, via the contextual cue. So in this, in this um, system, you only need two signals and, and still can have perfect communication. And the third game is ex exactly the same game, but just with two signals. And uh, in this kind of game, you um, then can also have, of course, a perfect, uh, a perfect system here, yeah, perfect ambiguous system. Now, um, I use this this because uh, the acronyms are sometimes hard to memorize. I use this kind of symbols here, these boxes, to better see what kind of games I talk about. A signaling game um, has no context to accuse. The context signaling and the context bottleneck game both have contextual cues, but the bottleneck game only two signals. Um, you can just make a simple mathematical analysis of the numbers of strategy pairs, and you see for the, they can strongly differ. So these are all possible kind of mappings, including contextual cues that you can have for a sender receiver um, strategies pair. And uh, the absolute number are not so important, but the relative numbers of how many perfect signaling systems you have, you see it's very low comparing it to all possible strategies. Um, and of course, the bottleneck game has no a perfect signaling system because it doesn't have enough signals. Uh, and then this is the number of perfect ambiguous systems. And here you can see that, um, of course, this Louis signaling game has no perfect ambiguous system because it doesn't have contextual cues. Um, is, what is nice about this context signaling game I defined is that uh, you have exactly the same number of perfect signaling systems and perfect ambiguous systems. And additionally, they also have both under a lot of different dynamics, the same Bayesian of attraction. What means 
they have roughly the same probability to um, uh, emerge starting from a random population state. Um, you can also make, um, you know, some some um, mathematical, uh, you use some mathematical tools to detect evolutionary stable strategies, and you will find that the perfect communicative strategies are all evolutionary stable. Interestingly, as, as, as soon as you have this kind of contextual cues, you have also um, kind of communication systems that are that don't ensure perfect communication. Let's say they only um, have a success rate from 83% or something, but they are still evolutionary stable. This is just a side note here. It's not important for the study. Now, you can now use these games and not only study, study mathematically, but also, let's say, uh, in a computer simulation. This is a quick example. Uh, jumping over the details, you have a population of agents here. You equip in each sim, uh, experiment. You equip every agent with a with a random strategy, um, a random sender and a random receiver strategy. They interact for a number of rounds. They communicate um, in, in each interaction. They communicate with everybody else, and then you can kind of sum up the score. And then they just randomly pick another agent and imitate the other agent strategy if the other agent scored better. And in the end, what you have is a population of agents who all use the same strategy, in general, at least. And when you make multiple of the simulation runs, you can then uh, study uh, the frequency of what kind of systems emerge at the end. And if you do this with um, the three games I introduced at the beginning, you find um, that this, and this red and blue kind of strategy Types are important. Uh, red is the perfect signaling systems where all signals are perfectly used and the perfect ambiguous systems. And they don't emerge all the time. This is also part of the population size uh, and we don't have any mutation. So you can get um, stuck in a non-optimal state. But what's more interesting here is that in this context signaling game, the emergence rate of perfect signaling and perfect ambiguity is exactly the same. Um, now, um, as I said at the beginning, this is this is nice, but now I would like to, to know, okay, this happens under adaptive dynamics who originally, um, you know, defined for biological evolution. And since we also talk about cultural evolution, and it's often assumed that we can uh, adopt, simply adopt this kind of, of dynamics also for um, you know, explaining or modeling cultural evolution. I was also interested in, if you do this in the lab, do we really get the same results? Or maybe um, you know, this kind of adaptive dynamics are not sufficient and we have to work more on this. This is at, at least what I'm interested in to make the mathematical models and the computation models um, better fitting to cultural evolution, especially with respect to language evolution. So coming back to the experiment. So um, we have here two part participants play a communication game together for a sequence of 30 rounds. Since the game is so simple, this is enough. Um, so in each round, the information set is, is presented at the beginning. And if you have context or cues, they are presented too. And then participants play the game and they can score for successful communication. Um, and then the final score will be transferred in real money. Of course, they get a participation fee, but they get also, you know, um, extra money for how well they scored. Um, okay, I, let me see if I get this running here because there should be a tutorial video how this works. Um, let me see. Ah, okay, I have to. Okay, this should work now. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, yeah, this is this is a video what you see at the beginning of such an experiment.
Yeah, so this was a video that you have an impression how this looks like and how this experiment is played. And as you can see, the contextual cues are in fact very informative. You could also have just um, you know a random uh, uh, you know kind of symbol, which then the participants have also to learn to that it correlates with specific um, information states, but I wanted to even, or we wanted to even uh, push that the participants use this contextual cues even more. Um, yeah, so this this was the, the game. Let me just jump over here. Yeah, so this is um, the experiment we made with in, in total 50 participants for this Lewis signaling game. The very first one, we only made one experiment because there were already results um, before and we more or less confirmed them. And then for the other, games we made two sessions each and um yeah we have uh, i had two hypotheses here one is that um the idea that that in the in the lab uh, participants are in general more successful than under adaptive dynamics and the reason why this is might be the case i will come explain later and then also that the different communication systems emerge roughly with the same relation than under adaptive dynamics and we'll also discuss about this later. Now, these are the results here. So this is the Lewis signaling game. And what you see is over the 30 rounds, we commuted for each block of six rounds how successful partic participants were. How, how the, so we measured the communicative success. And um, yeah, you see this five different differently colored lines. And these are the different five pairs. So 10 participants, so five pairs played and um, you, yeah, you see that the communicator success increases to maximum at the end. These are the results for the two sessions for the context signaling game. And also uh, with one exception in the last six rounds, everybody communicated successfully. And for the context bottleneck game, it was a little bit more complicated, but in total seven of 10 um, established a perfect system. This, this gray line on the right goes down, but this is only due to a mistake one of the participants make. You can easily see this from the data, but they already had established a system too. Okay, so this is um, to see that they really, um, you know, uh, increase strongly the communicative success from the beginning to the end in the experiment, not surprisingly, of course. And um, if you then look, uh, at the experimental results with respect to what kind of systems emerge, this would be the results for the three games and compare this with the results from the adaptive dynamics on the right now. Um, you first of all see that, yeah, the, the success rates are higher in the experiment for each game, um, but a more remarkable difference is that for the context signaling game, while ad adaptive dynamics expect perfect um, signaling and perfect ambiguity to emerge with roughly the same frequency in the lab uh, participants that develop a communi uh, successful communication system only de develop perfect signaling system. So they used always all three signals. And um, uh, so yeah, let me let me come to the, let me connect this to the uh, hypothesis we had, for example, higher frequency is confirmed and um, one important aspect here is that additive dynamics yeah, reproduce a blind trial and error process. So they can easily get trapped in non-global optima. Um, and uh, humans in the lab, even if they have a successful success rate from 90%, at least with this kind of simple uh, system, they probably have often the incentive to go to, to 100%. So this is that they are not it's not a blind process probably so they really um have the goal to to you know establish perfect communication uh, the, the same relation hypothesis is not confirmed as you could see for the context signaling game the one in the middle um and there could be some um yeah uh, hypothesis or propositions about this um first of all there seems to be preference for perfect signaling. And, and, and this 
however you could what well, you could first thing maybe this perfect ambiguous system is too too complex that participants cannot establish it because they have to combine contextual cues with signals but if you remember at the bottleneck um, uh, experiment they they are very good in doing it i mean as a 70 percent managed or seven of ten so they can do it but there seems to be this preference and one one point could be that that humans trust more um, interlocutors as long as I know we have aligned preferences, even though the other participants also want to score perfectly. And even I know this external cues are reliable according to the introduction, um, I rather trust that I can establish a perfect system with my participant. Um, so in, 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 in this sense, ambiguity is not preferred in, in the lab comparing to the adaptive dynamics. But there are also, of course, conditions that can be tested that promote the usage of contextual cues and the emergence of this kind of ambiguity. For example, as we saw with the bottleneck game, information bottleneck, and uh, of course, signaling costs. And we saw in the, the talk before when, when the, using more signals is too costly. Um, there's also a preference for this. Um, when there are non-aligned preferences, then I rather would maybe address cues, which I know that are perfectly reliable, than a communication partner who might want to mislead me and don't want to communicate successfully all the time. Um, and of course, the population size should be reconsidered. Um, because of the corona situation, we only made this, um, you know, two persons. So there were only two persons playing this game, two participants. Uh, because when you make this online, you make experiments with six or eight people playing the same game at the same time. This is almost not con it's not conductible. So when there's possibility to do this in the lab, this would be of course interesting. Because of course, with a group of six, a uh, uh, communication system is harder to establish, and then this kind of cues might be more interesting for participants. Um, and this should be tested. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>